at the end of hopefully at the end of this I, you know I, i'm hoping that um, at least people would take one or two things away that would have a positive impact in terms of either their personal lives their business lives or their future financial goals um, so yes thanks again for having me it's, it's it's a privilege it's a honor to be here and um, i'm grateful for the opportunity um, so yes, um, I wouldn't talk too much about my bio anymore because you have it um, already. Um, um, but what I would talk about really, um, I, I, quite, I quite have a lot of things to talk about, but I'll try and keep it concise. Um, I don't have a presentation, but I'm just kind of potentially going to walk you through my journey um, as an entrepreneur and how I got there. Um, I'll start by talking about how I became an entrepreneur. Um, a lot of people talk about entrepreneurship um, by design. Um, and by design, I mean, if you talk to some people, they will tell you they've always known they were going to be entrepreneurs. Um, or they, they had that vision right from day one that they couldn't be employees, but they had to do something on their own. So, the entrepreneurship journey has been like that for some people. Mine wasn't like that. Um, I started nine to five. Um, I would categorize my own venture into entrepreneurship as by evolution rather than by design. So I wouldn't say I always knew I was going to be an entrepreneur. I wouldn't say I've always had that vision to be an entrepreneur. Um, I, I got into entrepreneurship as I evolved over time. Uh, and my evolution came by my continuous um, search for knowledge, understanding, to learn more, to understand more, to learn new things. And over time, um, I began to evolve from being an employee into being the, the, an entrepreneur. And it took many, many years. Um, so it's, it, it was by no means a, a short process. It was a gradual process um, for me uh, personally. Um, I couldn't have, I didn't have a vision to be, be an entrepreneur, even though when I went in my early days um, after finishing um, university, I did, even before I started 95, I did venture into entrepreneurship back in Nigeria a little bit and I got totally schooled. Um, I lost money, um, I totally failed. Um, it was a total disaster. Um, but then again, for me, it was, yes, you, you failed, you learn from it and, and you move on. So that, that's how, that's a kind of a summary of, of my approach or my, my journey into entrepreneurship. And I think it begs the question, is entrepreneurship for everyone? Um, I would say no. Um, there's some people that would involve like me to entrepreneurship. There'll be people that would know from day one that their vision is entrepreneurship. There'll be people that are just naturally comfortable in nine to five. Um, so the fact that you're naturally comfortable doing nine to five does not mean you, you, are, you are any less successful. It doesn't mean you can still not achieve success. It doesn't mean that you can still not create wealth. It's, it's just a different pathway. Um, what I'd also do try, what I'd also try to encourage people about is, if you're naturally disposed to be a nine to five person, um, I know we're in an age where there's a lot of exposure to the internet, to social media. And um, what you tend to find is there's a lot of criticism of nine to five people. Um, 
that you cannot really get the best of wealth creation or the best of the world or the best of wealth or success until you become an entrepreneur. Um, I don't I don't agree with that. Um, so I would encourage people that are naturally disposed for a nine to five career to not feel bad um, about doing nine to five. Entrepreneurship is not the only route to success or to financial freedom. But what I would say is whether you choose to remain 95, whether you choose to venture into entrepreneurship, no matter what bucket you fit in or what, what, where, which space you fit in, you should always invest. Invest in yourself by learning day in, day out and improving your skills in whatever space you are in. And also invest in, in vehicles that can create wealth for you. Um, now, people are at liberty, liberty to choose what kind of vehicles they choose to invest in. Some people would invest in, choose to invest in property. Some people would choose to invest in um, stocks and shares. Some people would choose to invest in currencies. Some people would choose to invest in cryptos. Um, but whatever you do, either you're in the 95 space or you're an entrepreneur, always, always invest. Um, and what investment does is while you're doing your 95 or while you're running your business, an investment is a way for your money to work for you without you lifting a finger. Um, so again, I would encourage people to, to look um, um, into investment, in whatever space you're in. Um, now, of course, I would have preferences for, people, different people will have different preferences for what the types of investments they want to do. Um, but whatever you choose to do, make sure you have a good understanding um, of the investment type and you know it through and through before you allocate your capital to it. Um, so you can achieve financial freedom without entrepreneurship or from entrepreneurship. Um, um, and the way to do that is to really, you know, invest your money um, and let it work for you while you're sleeping. Um, I'll talk about the pros and cons of entrepreneurship, especially from a UK perspective. Um, the pros of entrepreneurship in, in the UK really is you have an environment that is that works, an environment that has structure that makes it easy for you to start a business and for you to run a business. Um, um, the other pros of entrepreneurship is it allows you um, the freedom for your time compared to nine to five. So nine to five, you're committed to someone else um, for a specific period of time in the day, nine o'clock to 5 p.m., sometimes longer. And your entire focus would be towards growing your employer's business. Um, but when you're an entrepreneur, um, you have one, you're not limited to nine to five. So you have flexibility for your time and your focus would be commitment towards growing your own business rather than someone else's um, business. Um, in terms of the, the cons of entrepreneurship, um, you would tend to find in, in, in this world of social media that um, if you're an entrepreneur, you automatically have all the time in the world and you're running your business and then you're away in Hawaii, you know, sipping on um, gin and juice or whatever it is uh, while your workers are working for you somewhere and you just have all the time in the world to enjoy and flex. From my own experience and my own perspective, I think that is a total lie uh, or total misconception. Um, as an entrepreneur, I've worked way harder than I worked as a nine to five person. Um, I, while I have flexibility for time because I can start my work anytime I choose to, and finish my work anytime I choose to. And what that allows me to do is I can fit my work better around my family um, life, um, but it doesn't mean I work um, any less harder. In, in fact, I, watch, I work much more harder than I was working um, in nine to five. 
Um, another misconception um, or a negative when it comes to, to entrepreneurship is outsourcing. So people view entrepreneurship as outsourcing. So you start a business and then you employ people to execute and the, the business plan or the, the business processes for you. And that means you can take a back seat and just relax and you know watch the business grow. Um, again, I, I don't think, um, I think that is a mis misconception. Um, as an entrepreneur, you probably work harder than anybody else in your team. Uh, you have to know your business way, way more than anybody else in your team. Um, as long as you have an employee, an employee will definitely in no way have as much commitment towards the growth of your business like you would do. And it will be a big, 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 massive mistake for you to assume they would because they would not. Um, if you do, you're going to be setting yourself up for um, disappointment. Um, so always expect that your employees would not give your business the same level of commitment um, that you would. And then that way you can kind of manage expectations and you can always kind of think uh, with a mindset that, you know, I have to keep a close eye on my business so that where my employees fall short, I either have systems or processes in place to catch those gaps and resolve the issues before it impacts the customer. Um, so um, those are certain ideas I have personally about the positives and the negatives of, of entrepreneurship. Um, in terms of the keys to success in, as, as an entrepreneur, specifically in the UK, um, one critical element is planning. Um, you, you, you should always, always have a business plan. A common pitfall that people tend to have is they have an idea, um, they think, it in their head as, oh, this is a fantastic idea. I can execute it. You don't really have a formal plan. You, you secure capital and you deploy capital and you hit the ground running without any kind of formal plan in terms of what your market looks like, what your competitors looks like, what your risks to the business businesses are, what is the economic landscape within your area or space of business, how do they affect you know, your business success factors? Um, so there, there's none of that. How, there's no planning around what the cash flow or future product profitability of the business is likely to look, at, look like. Um, so a lot of people just get capital, deploy capital without rock solid plans. Um, some people get forced into planning because they need to maybe secure capital to start the business. Maybe they want to start up loan from the bank. So the bank would of course ask for a business plan before they kind of commit money towards your business. People again, take that really lightly. Uh, the bank has asked for that business plan for a purpose because they want to know or get a feel for the viability of your business. Uh, what I tend to find is a lot of people go and ask other people, do you have a business plan I can copy? And they'll do a copy and paste and present it to the bank. And sometimes they get successful and they get a loan, sometimes not. But what you've done really is you've really not done any planning. You just copied and pasted someone else's work. So in reality, you really, really don't know your business or the factors affecting it. And therefore that is a common recipe for, for failure. Um, um, all the things that, you know, are keys to success is you have to know your business or your industry better than your competitor. Um, if you don't, you get slotted. Um, so you have to know the business inside out. Um, I'll give you a typical example. I, about over a year ago, I started a logistics company. Uh, what we do is we, we move products for companies from one part of the UK to the other. And, and when we move those products, we move them in box, in bulk using, you know, you know the, the biggest types of trucks you see on the motorway, the 44 ton trucks and the really, really massive long trailers. That's what we do. So for example, we could get a call from Amazon to say, can you ship our products from Doncaster to Glasgow? Um, 
And so that's the kind of service we have. So we, we, we help them move those products from one warehouse in one part of the country to another warehouse in another part of the country. Um, when, when I started the business, it, I'd never done logistics before. It was my first you know, foray into logistics. But there was one thing I did before I started the business. I had a business plan. I learned as much as I could um, about the industry, about the business cycle, about the seasonality of the industry. What kind of processes do I need to put in place? What kind of safety checks do I need to put in place? Because my vehicles are always on the road. So I need to make sure that my, my vehicles are properly maintained at specific intervals. Um, I need to make sure that the adequate safety standards for the vehicles, for the drivers, the entire end-to-end -end safety protocol needs to be maintained. So I did all that research and I learned so much about the business. Um, by the time we launched, I had another competitor who was already in the business for about, I don't know, five years ahead of me. And um, of course, for me, I was learning the ropes. Um, and as part of that, that process, I needed to recruit drivers. At the start, I didn't exactly know a lot about what to look out for to get the best quality drivers. So I ended up recruiting not so great drivers. Um, my competitor felt threatened and started attracting my drivers and they started leaving. And so what that means is if you are in logistics, especially in the world we are today where everything is online, someone clicks a button online and they want their products to be delivered the next day. Um, so that means you cannot miss a load. If, if, if Amazon calls you and says, move this from A to B, you have to be there on time to make sure that products move from A to B by a specific time so that it can get to the end customer by the time they've promised. So if your drivers leave and they don't turn up for work and you miss that load, it has a ripple effect on Amazon, which then have a ripple effect on the customer. So that means the customer doesn't get the products. And a lot of these um, online companies, they are big on customer service. So you have to make sure that your processes work, your drivers turn up on time, your, your trucks are in, in top shape and you know, they're not, there's, there's no breakdown um, on the roads and stuff. Um, so a lot of my drivers left um, for the competitor, but I, 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 I focused on execution. I continued to recruit. And what that meant was I started to think. So again, running a business or starting a business, you have to have an evolutionary mind. How do I continue to improve and learn as I improve? So for me in that kind of a scenario, what I did was I kept my recruitment ongoing. So I never stopped recruiting. I never stopped advertising for new drivers. So as a driver was leaving, I had someone already that has gone through the interview process ready to fill that, that, that gap. And that means I didn't miss loads. And I, 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 and I was able to execute 100%. And eventually I learned the ropes and I got a steady pool of drivers that had a level of commit commitment that I needed. And of course my competitor, because he, he felt threatened and he wanted me to run out of business, I started taking my, my drivers, he was luring them over with more money. Um, but again, because I'd done the business plan, I'd done the financials, I've done the planning, I knew that there's this particular limit for my business to remain viable, payroll being the highest cost for the business, I cannot afford to pay beyond a particular limit. And therefore, based on my research and my forecast, I stuck to my highest pay limit. And even though some drivers were leaving, I recruited more people, but I did not increase pay. Fast forward um, a year plus down the line, my competitor filed for bankruptcy. Um, one, because of financial mismanagement mainly, and two, because it was paying drivers way more than the business could afford. Um, so again, when you're starting a business, you're going to see all those challenges thrown at you. And if there's no kind of preparatory work and research, you will get carried away by the tide. So for example, I could have got carried away and say, I want to retain my drivers and therefore I would increase pay. We should have put my business in financial jeopardy. So again, the preparatory work and the planning allowed me to have the vision 
to stick to my guns and continue to execute, even though the, we had the challenges. Um, again, another critical success factor for running the business is willingness to, willingness to serve. When you're willing to serve your customer, you identify opportunities for business expansion. You order, you identify opportunities where you can service other customer needs, which create more product opportunities or more service opportunities for more revenues for your business. Um, of course, you have to have tenacity and you have to work really, really hard. Uh, if you're starting a business, you probably work five times as much as you work in night five. Um, any business I've started, I've typically in the first six months worked around the clock to make sure that the business launches safely and on a steady and it remains on a steady footing until I'm able to get reliable hands that I can have confidence to begin to, you know, delegate and you know step back gradually but strategically uh, without the business without losing any focus. Um, yes. Always, always focus on the customer. The customer is the engine of the business. If you don't keep your customers happy, is a recipe for, for disaster. Focus on cash flow. Very, very critical. Cash flow is the lifeblood of the business. Without cash, your business would go under within a matter of days, weeks, or months. Um, so again, back to your business plan, you have to be able to understand and have a good grasp now, one, one of the things that a lot of startups do is one, they don't look at cash flow from day one. Uh, you need to look at cash flow frequently, weekly, or at least monthly to understand what your cash flow picture looks like. Does the business have enough cash flow to pay its, its salaries, um, its, its suppliers, um, and have enough working capital to tide you over till your receivables come in? Very, 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 very critical. Um, you should always also look for opportunities for efficiencies using technology um, and systems and quality processes to make sure that your business doesn't become overly burdensome. Um, so look for the right tools, use for the right technology to ease the burden. Um, so for example, we have trucks in my logistics business that are all over the country at any specific point in time. With technology, I can track where each vehicle is at at any point in time, and I can track if it is running late or if there is a problem. So it allows me to then take action and look for initiate a recovery process, no matter what the problem is. And I can do that wherever I am in the world. Um, I don't have any. I don't have to be in a specific location. So leverage leverage technology critical to business success. Um, now, why do businesses pay, fail mostly? Um, poor cash flow planning, uh, not focusing on the customer. Um, a lot of people that I've come across when it, that are transitioning from nine to five into entrepreneurship tend to treat the business like employment. As an entrepreneur, to be successful, you have to totally have a, a mindset mindset shift. You cannot run your business like you are an employee. You cannot run your business as a meal ticket. Like your business is meant to give you a salary for you to maintain yourself and your family. If that is the mindset, your business would remain small and would only generate what you need for yourself and your family. So you must see your business as more than a meal ticket. You must see it as a fully fledged business with the capability to expand and grow into a mid-sized or large-scale business. So you have to always maintain a big, big vision and think beyond, I'm running this business to, for it to be a source of sustenance for myself and my family. It can and should be much more bigger than that. Um, I would pause there. I'm not sure how I'm doing for time. Um, I'm not sure if I've used up my 25 minutes. You yet. have. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but you kept the time. Very definitely. Yeah. Well done. Yeah, but I think I, I've kind of captured the main, main, main points I, I, I wanted to talk about. And just to kind of wrap up, I would just want to delve a little bit more into just 
a minute or two into my journey. Um, I started my, my career in financial services in Nigeria. Um, and my original vision was to be an executive in a financial institution. Uh, and that was my focus. And that was my focus for many, many years. And I spent a many, many years in financial services. Uh, eventually I came to the UK in 2008 and I still continued my work in financial services. But I'm an accountant by training and it got to a point I started to think to myself, I can actually use this accounting to generate passive income or side income as a side hustle. And that's when I registered the company and started the accounting firm. And it started with one customer and I focused purely on customer service. And if I can keep this one customer happy, he would refer me to the next customer. And that's how the business has grown over the years. I've not done any marketing. I've not done any social media advertising. It is just been deliver quality customer service and your customer would always recommend the next person. And the business has grown organically like that over the years. Um, and one thing I would say about entrepreneurship is once you switch into that mode, it unlocks your creativity and you will begin to see opportunities you would not see if you're a nine to five employee. Because if you're a nine to five employee, your focus is on your employer. Your, your mindset is locked to that nine to five where you're fully devoted to that employer. What that means is your focus is in one position. You can have a hundred opportunities fly past your vision and you would not see them. But the moment you shift into entrepreneurship and you're kind of going about your business, you be, your mindset begins to open up and you begin to see opportunities that you can explore. Um, and that's how I started accounting and I then did logistics. Um, now I'm in fintech um, as well. So it's, 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 a, it's, it's a beautiful transition. It is totally do doable for anyone that wishes to explore that, that path. And um, if that is the path you've chosen, by all means, it is doable, it is achievable, and you can, by all means, succeed uh, beyond your wildest dreams, um, depending on how far you want to take it. Um, I hope I've been able to at least encourage someone and, and hope someone has picked up one or two pointers in terms of what they want to do, how they want to go about it. And again, thank you so much for, for the opportunity. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for um, the um, introduction and the deep dive and just sharing your journey with us on how you started and where you are now as an entrepreneur. We're very grateful for that. I know that this is, um, our Q&A session. So we're going to start to ask you some questions, but <clears throat> while you were talking, I, I, I sort of um, noted a couple of questions I wanted to ask just for the benefits of the people who are here before okay. um, everyone starts to ask this. So one of the questions I wanted to ask uh, was, you said that um, <clears throat> that you're not an entrepreneur by design, but you, you evolved into that. So I want, wanted to know what what was the tipping point for it did you have an epiphany did something happen what was that thing that sort of edged yeah. you on to get in there thanks okay so yeah i i think it, it requires me to delve deeper into into my journey uh, and i would explain how that happened so i've always focused on being the best in what i do which was at the at the start financial services so I will put it, I will put in my all my all to kind of separate myself from from the pack. Um, I did that for many many years, and um, I got a lot of promotion uh, over the years. Um, now I was also also always thirsty for knowledge, so I I was always reading, um, and it got to a point I. Around 2006, 2007, um, I started to invest in stocks um, in Nigeria then. And I had the bulk of my, my, my resources, my capital was in, in, in stocks. 
And the, the financial crisis happened and I lost it all. I, it was, I was back to zero. And I, after that, I came to the UK. And at the time, I, I started continuing my financials, my, my work in financial services. And I'd sworn to myself, I would never touch stocks anymore. And a friend of mine approached me at some point and says, well, why don't we start investing in stock? And I told him my experience. And he said, okay, why don't we, first of all, learn how it's done? And then put what we learn into practice rather than doing the way you did it the other time by just following the crowd. So I said, okay, yes, let's, let's give it a shot. And in that process, we thought about, okay, what do we, where do we learn from? Who is the best investor that we know? And we did a research online and we came about Warren Buffett. And we looked, we looked for books about him and we started to read. And we read and read and read. And the more we read, the more comfortable we became. And we started to invest. And as we invested, we were seeing some success on like the first time round. But what investment does is it begins to unlock your entrepreneurial mind. And, and that's, that's the evolution process there. Because as an investor in stocks specifically, even though you're not involved in managing the businesses you're investing in, you are a part owner of that business. And for you to be a part owner, but for you to invest or like invest the way Warren Buffett does, you almost have to understand the business you're investing in. So that means you have to kind of do complete research about the history, the, the market forces around the, the nature of the business, you know, the financial performance of the business, how the business operates, has been able to achieve success. So by learning and reading those things, I didn't know unconsciously I was opening up my entrepreneurial mind. So that was the evolution process for me. So naturally, from investing, I then transitioned to, okay, how does Warren Buffett invest? So he, he does invest by buying shares in companies, but his preferred or his most preferred way to invest is actually to buy businesses as a whole. And which meant, meant he was a business owner. So for me, it was that natural evolution from investing by buying shares to actually starting a business and then in actually thinking about, okay, I've started the business, it's, it's, it's successful and it's generating so much cash flow than I, than I need. So I need to look for opportunities to then invest this actual excess cash flow into either buying other good quality small businesses or starting new businesses. And that was the evolution for me. Thank you very much. Thank you. So essentially the failure was kind of like a feedback to you exactly. to learn yes. okay to learn. So, yes so the next question then which falls on the back of this one and i think you mentioned it was i wanted to ask questions about mentorship whether whether you thought that mentorship was in some ways warren buffett through his books became your mentor so i was just exactly. thinking what do you think of mentorships and what do you think of master classes especially for those who are currently in the nine to five some of whom have maybe a, a natural thing to be entrepreneurs or who are just kind of looking for ways to break out of that. How would you um, advise on mentorship in that regard? And then how would you um, advise on how they structure their kind of exit from the nine to five to position in the entrepreneurial sort of uh, engagement or activities? Thank you. Okay, great, great question. So I would say mentorship is a very, very crucial element. However, mentorship should not only be seen as, let me find someone in my local environment that I can speak uh, to on the day-to-day -day or specific intervals um, to help me through the process. You could have a virtual mentor. Um, in my case, mine was virtual. My mentor was hands down Warren Buffett even though he doesn't know me, but he's mentored me. And the way he's mentored me is, I've read every book I can lay my hands on about him and how he invests. I attend 
his company's annual general meeting every year without fail. Now, if anybody is knows about um, Warren Buffett's annual general meeting, he runs the company called Berkshire Hathaway. And they do this annual general meeting every year where he talks about all the businesses in the conglomerate and then he presents the financials. And then there is a Q&A session where people in the shareholders, members of the general public, other investors have the opportunity to, to ask questions about the business, uh, about the conglomerate. It, th those annual meetings are like a masterclass in business. You, I, I don't think the things you learn there, you would, you would get in an MBA class. Um, so I, I attend that every year without fail. And then what I also do is, because he's such a good teacher, um, he presents, when he presents the financial statements for the company, there is usually a summary of the performance of the business, but his views on the general economy and the global economy, things like the impact of inflation on businesses or recessions and, and things like that. So for me, my mentorship through him involved me going back to the start of his business when he started Berkshire Hathaway, I think that was in the 60s. And I've read every annual letter from the start today. And it's like almost a Bible in business. When you so let's I get I think my takeaway would be don't limit yourself in terms of thinking a mentor has to be someone that is in your local environment. Try and pick who you think is the best at what you want to do and find ways either physically or virtually to learn from them. Um, that would be my perspective. In terms of how best to manage the transition from nine to five to entrepreneurship, again, it's a unique journey for each person. Different people have different risk appetites. So it's not going to be a one-size-fits-all approach. Um, it just depends on your natural disposition towards risk. Some people are completely risk-averse. And therefore, what that means is they want to continue the nine-to-five and then maybe start a side hustle that they can do maybe for a few hours a day and keep it at that. Okay, It is still entrepreneurship but it's not full scale because they all, they, they, they are risk of us and they like the comfort of a steady income, it's a, a, a job, you know? So, and there's totally nothing wrong with that. Um, some people are more risk averse and they will start with their nine to five and then build a side hustle and grow it. It can be challenging and grow it to an extent whereby it, the nine to five becomes unnecessary anymore um, and they just switch completely into entrepreneurship. There's some people that are totally, totally love risks. They see the idea, they see it can work. They start it and they jump ship, drop the nine to five and give it 100%, give entrepreneurship 100% attention. So you almost have to understand where you are in the spectrum of risk. Am I totally risk averse? Am I midpoint risk or am I fully risk on? And then that would kind of determine what kind of approach you would take. My approach when I did the transition from nine to five was I was doing my nine to five and I started my accounting firm at the same time. And my accounting firm grew to the point where I felt, you know what, the nine to five is now hindering the accounting. So I need to drop the nine to five and focus on accounting. Um, that was my journey. Uh, I didn't jump straight from nine to five and focus on accounting. I grew it side by side until the accounting started to, and I, I wasn't giving my all in the nine to five anymore. I was totally distracted. I was like, you know what? It's time to pack it up um, and leave at least a, a decent legacy um, of where I was working. Um, that was my journey. But yeah, it depends on the, the natural risk appetite of each person.
Thank you so much, Remy. Okay, so now I'm going to uh, open the floor. Please uh, use an emoji to signify um, that, that you would like to ask a question and please go ahead and ask the question. Thank you. We are waiting. No, I mean, it looks like you did a very great job. <laughs> looks like it. Yeah, people are like. I have a question. Okay, cool. Please go ahead. So, um, so now, probably two questions. Now, you started as a nine to fiver and then move on to business. And I was wondering that, and there's something you mentioned that uh, you cannot, you should not be running a business and, or maybe starting a business, I don't know the exact words, and trying to, uh, like you're trying to make your day-to-day -day from that business. Now, you started as nine to five and you, uh, you're now in business. How did you, did you ever had a fallback? Did you have uh, ever like created a cushion that if this business doesn't work out, there's a, maybe there's a plan or where you just like, you jump into it and, you know, uh, and let's see how it goes kind of person or where you like the person that, had um, maybe savings or uh, a cushion for, uh, let's say this doesn't work out. There is something I can fall back to. Or if your, uh, if your clients, you don't have enough clients uh, or if they're not paying, um, you don't have enough paying clients, when you're like, okay, there's something else that can help you survive even even when while you're doing um you continue in business. So that's one. Um the second one would be going back to the age long question of based on your experience, um starting a business, I'm sure you started small and you continue to grow that business. And also seeing maybe there are businesses that started at the same time as you started and there are not more what would you say are the maybe two or three reasons, top reasons why uh, small businesses fail? Okay, excellent. Thanks. Thanks for the questions. Great questions. So when I transitioned into entrepreneurship, I, I, I would, I wouldn't say I had a backup plan. I wouldn't say, Oh, I didn't go into it thinking if I failed, what what next? Um, I think the way I transitioned um, was also a factor in, in that regard because I'd grown the accounting firm to a scale that I felt comfortable that it was less like the, the, the likelihood of failure was limited. Except, um, you know, there was a major, major economic shock that would maybe not only impact my business, but impact, you know, the general business environment. And I think that's also where the, the, the business plan and the nature of the business you're going to also matters. Now, I think the, the kind of backup approach you would have would depend on the type of business you are going to do, okay? Now, this is where you begin to think about different types of businesses and what kind of, what are the characteristics? There are certain businesses that are seasonal. There are certain businesses that are, we call them defensive businesses or recession-proof businesses. Defensive businesses or recession-proof businesses are those businesses that you do that people need the product or service, irrespective of whatever is happening in the global economy. 
okay? Um, food and beverages is one of them. Whether it is recession or not, people would always need to eat, okay? So you'd always potentially have sales. Accounting is one of them. No matter what is going on in the economy, businesses have to file their tax returns. People have to file their tax returns. People would always need financial advice or investment advice. It, it, it's recession proof. So if you're going for that, those types of defensive businesses, the risk factor is, is lower. And therefore, you're less likely to be worried about backup plan compared to a seasonal business. Um, maybe like fashion or um, or like logistics, for example. Logistics is very, very seasonal. People do a lot of shopping towards the end of the year during festive times. Start of the year is really quiet. So if you're launching, if you're moving from nine to five into a logistics business and you've not studied the seasonality of the business and you're launching at the start of the year, you're gonna struggle because it is very dry. Okay, so your understanding of the business you're doing plays a key factor in, in the back of plan that you might have. Again, for me, one other thing I had at the back of my mind was my experience and expertise in financial services. I knew that the worst, what was the worst? I thought of the worst case scenario. Worst case scenario, my accounting firm totally flops and everything goes to zero. Um, I knew I had the capacity if I chose to, to get a job to tie the time um, or to weather the storm until I'm able to either resurrect my business or create a new one. And when I think like that, uh, the way I think about it is I don't think about my skill set or my experience at only just financial services. I know there's, there's, there's a lot I can put my hands to to generate money. Um, I'm, I'm not the kind of person that would think to myself, oh, if everything goes pear-shaped, I have to get an accounting job or a banking job. I don't really care if I have to drive an Uber to support my family. I don't care if I need to work in a factory to support my family. As long as I can do something to bring money on the table while I weather the storm. So I, I, I totally do not limit myself. As long as I have a vision and I have a dream and I have something I want to execute, I remove all limits um, to make sure I succeed. Um, that's been my approach. That's been my backup plan. So my backup plan is do whatever it takes to make sure that you can weather the storm and succeed at whatever you want to do. Um, in terms of the top factors that 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 make businesses fail or startups fail, one is failure to plan. Um, not doing enough research or understanding your business and the business environment and the factors that affect your business. The second factor is cash flow mismanagement. For a lot of mistakes people make is they, they start a business and they say, oh, I'm, I'm not an accounting person, I'm not a numbers person, I'm not a finance person, and therefore I'll engage an accountant to look after the numbers. I want to focus on generating sales. Personally, I think that is a big mistake. You don't have to be fantastic at numbers, but the setting critical building blocks of your business, you must know, even if you're waking up from sleep in the middle of the night, you must understand your revenue drivers. How do I generate revenue? How much revenue do I generate? And then you must understand what does it cost me to generate one pound or one dollar of revenue? Those two information is very critical. Why they're critical is it helps you to make sound financial business decision. Say, for example, and this is a common pitfall, you're looking to secure a new business or a new contract um, or a new clientele. 
and you have to price your service or your product. You must know or understand what to offer and when to walk away. So if you don't understand your revenue and what it costs to generate one unit of revenue, you're going to misprice your product or service. And when you do, you, you will find out you, you might end up in a scenario whereby what you're paying out from the business in terms of expenses out, outweighs what is coming in in revenues. And that is a recipe for disaster. Um, so again, I'll use the logistics business as an example. In logistics, you have to look for customers who you can help move your products. The customers are going to tell you, if I want to move something from point A to point B, this is what I'm willing to pay. You must understand how much it will cost your business to deliver that product from A to B. If you don't and you accept anything you're given, then you might end up incurring more cost to move that product than what you're getting. So by understanding your revenue structures and your cost structures, you know when to accept new business or when to walk away from a business proposition that doesn't work for you. Because the problem with that is you might have existing business that is profit generating and positive cash flow generating. But in expanding, if you don't understand your cost structures, you would take new business that will totally wipe out the gains you're making from your existing business and throws your business into a financial tailspin. So your cost structures, very important, very critical. You must know where you, you, you have the wiggle room to cut costs or to maintain costs. Um, you must understand your sales, your cost structures, and your margins. Critical. Uh, very, very critical. Um, what else? Focus on the customer. If you focus on delivering value to the customer, the, your, your, your percentage of success is almost guaranteed. For any person that is looking to start a business, I would advise, um, because at the moment, there is no company in the world that loves the customer or, the, or, or treats the customer the best, like Amazon. For anyone that wants to start a business, I would ask that you go and Google Jeff Bezos, the founder of Amazon, Google his first letter to his shareholders when he started the business, when he started Amazon, the first financial year's shareholders letter. It is, it is a beautiful piece. It, it, you could tell from that first year how his focus has been on the customer. It will help you shape your vision in terms of customer satisfaction for your business. It is a beautiful, beautiful annual shareholders letter. So for anybody starting a business, Google it up and read it. If possible, frame it somewhere in your office that you can always refer to it. So it helps you shape and drive your vision. Thank you. I hope I've answered your question. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, um, Ade Bakari, please go ahead with your question. Thank you. Um, okay, thank you. I was actually going to put my hands down. Most of what I wanted to ask has been um, answered, uh, but I think I'll I'll just go through with with one of the questions. Um so you you have a a case study on hand that relates to logistics. I've played in the logistics um um field for a couple of years now, in fact with Amazon, uh, but could not proceed. I think um th there were challenges around COVID that that limited how they took up. Um, they used to call them um, partners for yes. that, that that would help them manage their fleets. So yes. 
I, I was just going to ask if you think that um, it's it's there is a better opportunity now to get on, and if one wants to come on board, um, I'm actually into um bigger. Okay, so initially it was it was it was smaller buses and all that. Okay. Uh, but right now, do you think it's an it's a good opportunity to get into trucking with them? And how how do you think um it is to to get on board? What what are what are the requirements? Is it is it um is is the financial base same as what used to be with the initial dealership i don't know okay then second let me just add this how do we connect with you okay yeah i would um i can share my email address at the end of the meeting um okay so feel free to to touch base by email um okay now um in terms of amazon and the opportunities opportunities for trucking uh in terms as far as the engagement i have with them and what I can see at the minute, I I know that they are currently not taking any new partners. Um, I'm speaking purely from the UK perspective. I don't know of any other place. Um, I know that they they have a portal where they they advertise um, loads and people go and bid for them. But again, that is kind of, it's different from the partner program they have. And so you, you have to go in there and you know pick loads and, and um, bid for those loads. And that tends to kind of favor maybe really, really s- much smaller um, trucking companies, maybe like a one-man trucking company where the, the truck owner is also the driver. Or maybe you have a small fleet of one or two um, so that bid process favors those kind of people more. Um, the partner program, I know that there was a lot of right sizing that happened earlier in the year um, when the new CEO, I can't remember his name now, um, where he came and he did an announcement and his focus was on cost optimization and they were trying to kind of become leaner from a cost perspective. Um, so they, they slashed a lot of their, their, their headcount and they streamlined the, the partner program quite heavily. Um, I know at the time they scaled back on, on the partners. A lot of poor performing ones were let go. Um, people that have had a, quite a sizable number of, of trucks they were using to support Amazon, they kind of downsized them quite a bit. Um, again, that was also a ripple effect of what was happening in the broader economy in terms of inflation. Um, Because as inflation started to creep up, it meant that wages didn't creep up at the same pace, which means people's spending power had dropped and people shopped less. And therefore Amazon had less things to move about. So they needed to shrink their their logistics division quite considerably. Um, How that is going to shape in the future, I have no idea. But I think a lot of it will be linked to how the economy picks up, what the inflation picture looks like, what people's spending power looks like over the near term into the future. Um, So that's from the trucking side. I do see that Amazon is currently, or as long as, as near as a few weeks ago, was advertising on the van side of things. And they were looking for more partners in that space. Um, in specific areas, I know they were looking at, um, I think South England, they were looking at North, North of the UK, so Scotland, um, the Northeast um, as well. And then I think somewhere up to Carlisle as well, they were looking for, um, they call them DSPs, delivery service partners. Um, they're looking for people to, to get involved. Um, so, I mean, I'll drop my email anyway if you want links in terms of getting involved from the band side of things. I can certainly share um, 
one or two of them with you if you don't already have the information. Um, but yeah, that is as far as I know. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I think Lola's hands are raised. Do you want to go ahead? Yes. Thank you very much. Um, thanks for this session. So I have, my question is in two folds. Um, so the first is, you kind of covered it a little bit earlier on about benchmarking your your rate. So um, back in Nigeria, I, I had a consulting firm that I was, you know, it was like my side gig. And before I left, which was last year, I was actually making enough, making more than my salary and my my plan was to come to the UK and to just start up the consulting, just continue as well because I already had clients. So I work in the development sector and I was already consulting for all the big NGOs um, back in Nigeria. But then on getting here um, and then doing my research and I realized that I was actually charging lower than the market that all the other consulting firms in or individuals were charging. And so I upped my price. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I started to notice that um, I wasn't really getting, not callbacks, but I wasn't really getting the job at the end of the day. So they'll say, oh, you're great and all that. But then at the end of the day, they walk away. And I'm at a point now where I'm beginning to think um, that um, what do you need to do? I don't think I need to break into the sector because I believe I have all the skills, all the experience as well to back it up. And I know I will deliver a good job. But... Mm -hmm. Trying to start a firm in 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 UK, for instance, how were you able to grow your consulting firm, um, especially when it comes to daily rates? How do how did you how were you able to you know balance that in terms of you wanting to really get this job right, and then also being competitive as well, um, being competitive as well, but not too competitive so, such that it drives your potential clients away because I was beginning to think that, oh, maybe because then I was getting paid in pounds and euros and I was changing it to Naira and I thought I was earning mm -hmm. them. But now that I'm, I have to pay my bills in pounds, it's yeah. not, you know, it's not that big of a, you know, in terms of what I'm paying and what mm -hmm. I was paid. And how did you walk through that? What advice would you have? Um, The second is, so I'm, it's a consulting firm, right? I'm not hiring, I'm not buying, I'm not selling. It's me and my mm -hmm. skill. If I need to pull someone on the job, I give them a cut of whatever it is I'm being paid. So do mm -hmm. I need to have a business plan as well? Because I really want to register this business and I really want to grow it as well. Um, I, I really want to grow it as well and be known um, in the UK as well for this service that I offer. Um, what would be your take on, on that as well? Thanks. Okay, yes, uh, great question. So now while you are operating in Nigeria, because your, your cost base in Nigeria is quite low, okay? So your pricing was quite competitive and you will get a lot of work that way because people will give you work because essentially they're thinking, oh, I can get value for money. Um, and so what you've done effectively in itself without realizing it is a strategy, which is what a lot of big companies do, right? So for example, if you think about Apple, why is it that they don't do their manufacturing in the US? They do their manufacturing in China. That's effectively true. I think we've lost you, Remy. We can't hear you. It looks like we lost him.
We just hold off for a couple of more minutes. I think maybe there might be a problem with the connection. <laughs> 